Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Well, it's been a long time, but I'm finally covering dinosaurs again. But, this being a Dr. Polaris video, I'll be going over the underappreciated and surprisingly controversial pachycephalosaurs. Indeed, despite being present at the world-famous Hell Creek formation of Lake Cretaceous North America, alongside iconic dinosaurs such as T-Rex and Triceratops, the thick-headed reptiles have not entered pop culture stardom to anywhere near the same extent as their neighbours. Their most famous appearance was probably in The Lost World, Jurassic Park, where Roland Tembo's mercenaries have trouble wrangling a stubborn Pachycephalosaurus. Although I personally do strongly remember the so-called Dracorex from Primeval, and I'm glad that the group as a whole have been featured in Season 2 of Prehistoric Planet. The reason that these animals have not developed iconic status is probably due to the fact they were relatively modestly sized herbivores between 60 centimeters and 4.5 meters long, with this also being the fate of the many, many other small ornithischians, which are generally seen as being also rans. However, I am of the opinion that pachycephalosaurs are actually very interesting and there is much to say about them. These bipedal animals are defined by the possession of thickened, heavily ossified skulls, wide torsos with expansive gut cavities, and small leaf-shaped teeth, well suited for cutting and slicing vegetation. Interestingly, pachycephalus or premaxillary teeth in the upper jaw were larger and often fang-like, with it being suggested that these may indicate a more omnivorous diet. Perhaps, like some modern ungulates, these dinosaurs may have supplemented their largely herbivorous diets with insects and possibly even carrion or small vertebrates. All species also possessed heavily ossified skulls, which varied from flat and partially raised in basal forms to the domed high-crowned heads of derived genera such as adult individuals of Pachycephalosaurus. In some genera, it has turned out that the flat-headed forms actually represent either juveniles or females, but more on that later. The function of their greatly thickened skulls has generated a sizable amount of debate amongst paleontologists. For most of the 20th century, it was thought that the skull dome was utilised in head-butting behaviour, similar to that of modern bighorn sheep or muskox. Anatomical evidence for combative behaviour includes vertebral articulations providing spinal rigidity, and the shape of the back indicates strong neck musculature. Also, the rounded shape of the skull would lessen the contacted surface area during headbutting, resulting in glancing blows. Other possibilities include flank butting, defence against predators, or both. However, during the late 90s and early 2000s, several studies proposed that pachycephalosaurs could not engage in direct headbutting due to the spongy nature of their cranial bones and the supposed inability of their necks to resist high-impact collisions. A role in species recognition and signalling was proposed instead. More recent studies have questioned these assumptions, such as one conducted in 2013 by Peterson, Dickler and Longrit, that found evidence for widespread cranial damage in multiple genera of dome-headed pachycephalosaurs. The frequency of such injuries provides strong evidence that these animals did indeed engage in head-on ramming behaviour. The rear of the skull is notable for the presence of a bony shelf, which often housed small spiky horns, which were almost certainly utilised for display and sexual signalling. This feature unites pachycephalosaurs with the ceratopsians in the clade marginocephalia. In the case of the latter, the bony margin at the rear of the skull developed into elaborate neck frills. The condition in their dome-headed cousins was far more basal, as was their bipedal posture, lack of a hooked beak, and less specialised teeth, which were not as efficient in chopping and grinding. Indeed, gastrolith stones have been found in association with pachycephalosaurs, while these have only been discovered alongside basal ceratopsians such as Cetacosaurus. Also, unlike Ceratopsians, which have a detailed fossil record stretching back to the late Jurassic circa 161 million years ago, Pachycephalosaurs suddenly appear during the late Cretaceous, with the oldest known form being Cynocephaly, which was native to China roughly 92 million years ago. This was not even a basal Pachycephalosaur, which alongside their sister group relationship with Ceratopsians, suggests that these animals have a long ghost lineage extending back into the late Jurassic, with East Asia probably being the region in which they first diverged. In addition to a mysterious fossil record, these dome-headed dinosaurs are known largely from skull material alone, 
with postcranial remains being rare. At least where North American members of the group are concerned, it's been put forward that these animals may have lived in more mountainous environments, away from the flat floodplains below, with their heavy skulls being washed downstream into the lowlands, therefore explaining the rarity of their postcranial remains. However, a convincing 2014 study by Jordan Mallon et al. has demonstrated that this was not the case with pachycephalus or skull showing no signs of wear or erosion associated with waterborne transport. Thus, it is highly likely that animals such as pachycephalosaurus lived alongside Tyrannosaurus triceratops and the rest in the swamp forests of Maastrichtian North America. However, let us move away from the latest and most derived members of the group to explore some of the more basal forms. The most basal representative of the clade so far known is the genus Wananosaurus, which was native to the early to middle Maastrichtian of China between 72 and 69 million years ago. This tiny animal is currently the smallest known pachycephalosaur, with the holotype representing a fully mature individual that measured just 60 centimeters or two feet long, being comparable to a modern European rabbit in terms of size. The skull roof was flattened, while the temporal openings were large for a pachycephalosaur, which both point to its basal position in the group. It is also the only known member of the clade to be placed outside the family Pachycephalosauridae, which contains all other genera. The presence of Wananosaurus so late into the Cretaceous is yet another sign of a long ghost lineage for these animals, potentially stretching back almost 70 million years. The better known genus Stegoceras was a basal member of Pachycephalosauridae proper, being a 2 to 2.5 meter long animal native to what is now North America between 77 and 74 million years ago. About the size of a goat, this genus possessed a skull that was roughly triangular in shape, with a short snout and had a thick, broad and relatively smooth dome on the top. Juvenile individuals were flat-headed, with the dome developing at the onset of sexual viability. Currently, only one species, S. validum, is considered to belong to this genus, with another species, S. novomexicanum, potentially representing the remains of an immature individual of the larger pachycephalosaur Spherotholus instead. The teeth of Stegoceras were small and leaf-shaped, with tests indicating a broad herbivorous diet composed of low-growing plants. As in other members of the group, the function of the skull dome in this animal has been the subject of debate, with most recent studies confirming that Stegoceras was certainly capable of taking head-on collisions, with the stiffened tail and stocky hind limbs enabling a degree of shock absorption. As in modern artiodactyls, the skull dome also likely served as a display structure as well, with some conflicts being resolved through threat rather than violence. Among adult specimens, it has been found that those with the tallest domes possessed the most injuries, suggesting that these individuals may have been territorial males. Other pachycephalosaurs also possess distinctive anatomical features. The basal goyocephaly, for example, was a flat-headed genus less than 2 meters long and had notably heterodont dentition, with large fang-like teeth at the pre-maxilla and small leaf-shaped teeth along the maxilla, separated by a diastema. These tusk-like teeth may have been used similarly to those of the living musk deer, being employed in intraspecific competition and display. As these animals evolved and developed, the more familiar rounded domed skulls appeared in forms like the North American Acrotholus and Prenocephaly from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. The latter genus was recently featured in the second series of Prehistoric Planet, where a herd was seen annoying the ankylosaur Tarchia. Like most members of the family, Prenocephaly is only known from cranial material, with all restorations of the body being based on related animals. As far as we know, Pachycephalosaurs seem to have possessed similar and quite conservative body plans throughout their evolutionary history. This is combined with the often very partial nature of their remains and makes individual genera fairly difficult to discuss. Indeed, the genera Alaskacephaly, Foraminocephaly and Coleopicephaly are known entirely from cranial fragments and as such little can be said about them. However, a great deal can be said about the largest and last member of the family, Pachycephalosaurus itself. This genus was native to the Hell Creek formation of Western North America between 70 and 66 million years ago. Although only known from a single well-preserved skull and additional cranial fragments, it was almost certainly the largest Pachycephalosaur so far described, with a skull roof up to 10 inches thick 
and the entire animal is estimated to have measured about 4.5 meters or 14.8 feet long. It would have weighed between 370 and 450 kilograms or up to 990 pounds. Being comparable to large modern deer, such as the elk or wapiti, in terms of size. Like other members of the family, it probably possessed a wide abdomen for digesting plant matter, tiny forelimbs, and robust, stocky hindlimbs. A series of short horns projected backwards from the rear of the skull, while the snout was covered in upward pointing bumps and nodules. Somewhat surprisingly for a low browsing herbivore, the eye sockets were quite large and forward facing giving the animal a degree of binocular vision, which is probably useful when engaging in antagonistic social behaviour. The maxillary teeth were tiny and leaf-shaped, being well suited for slicing through soft plant material such as leaves, fruits and seeds, with the genus not being able to chew tougher, woodier plants as their ceratopsian cousins could. The premaxillary teeth, on the other hand, were sharp and blade-like, which is a common feature of pachycephalosaurs, and suggests that the animal may have included insects or a small amount of meat in its diet. Although it is currently accepted that this genus was probably the only representative of its family at Hell Creek, it was once thought that it shared this environment with two closely related genera, with these being Stigimoloch and Dracorex. The former is only known from a juvenile skull with a reduced dome and large spikes, while the latter, also known only from a juvenile skull, had a seemingly flat head with short spiky horns. Due to their unique cranial ornamentation, they were seen as separate species for a number of years. However, in 2007, paleontologist Jack Horner argued that Stigimoloch and Dracorex actually represented juvenile individuals of Pachycephalosaurus, with the animals losing their spiky horns and developing thick cranial domes as they aged into maturity. This hypothesis has gained wide support, although some recent studies suggest that Stiggy Moloch may represent either a genuine genus or a species of Pachycephalosaurus, due to the fact that its remains are only found in the upper part of the Hell Creek formation. The fact that the thickened skull dome developed only in mature individuals strongly implies that this feature was used in conjunction with mating displays and combative behaviour, as well as indicating the health and fitness of the individual. As mentioned earlier, the ability for pachycephalosaurs to engage in direct head-butting behaviour began to be questioned in the late 90s and early 2000s, with it being proposed that the skull domes were too fragile and spongy to be used in ramming head-on. Instead, flank-butting was seen as being more likely. However, examinations of cranial lesions in this genus and comparisons with living head-striking artiodactyls, such as the bighorn sheep, strongly imply that these animals were engaging in headbutting, with the flat-headed specimens lacking any such damage. In addition to the controversial Stiggy Moloch, Pachycephalosaurus would have lived alongside another member of the family, Spherotholus, in Maastrichtian Laramidia. The genus was roughly half the size of its larger relative, and was a highly derived animal, possessing a tall, rounded skull dome. Despite being relatively uncommon herbivorous dinosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs persisted successfully until the very end of the Cretaceous, dying out in the KPG extinction event. In my opinion, their mysterious fossil history and development of incredibly varied appearance at different stages of life made Pachycephalosaurs an interesting and underrated group of dinosaurs that are too easily forgotten about. I hope that this video can serve to remedy this situation somewhat. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the evolutionary development of the monotremes and their possible basal relatives, the Australosphenidans. See you again soon. Cheerio.